and speaking to us from these green glowing discs in the ceiling uh, from our new system that we have here at the department. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Marquardt building. Um, oh, look, my gavel's back. <laughs> I haven't had a gavel in two years. You might even have the breakfast thing. <laughs> Um, so just a little uh, housekeeping, um, bathrooms are down the hall if you need them. Uh, there is a water fountain out there. Um, if you need anything else within the building, just let me know. Um, and I've got a few Marine Patrol officers down the hall if anybody, <laughs> if, the, if the crowd gets rowdy, um, you know how they get sometimes. So, um, so uh, we do have your board per diem forms, which are within are in your packet. Just uh, call your attention to those to, to have them filled out if possible prior to the meeting. If not, uh, submitting them back into Sarah. Um, moving, uh, let's do introductions actually, since we're all in a room together um, and um, seeing each other for the first time. Um, I'm going to begin and go this way, and I'll uh, end with Jim, and then we're going to actually go to the audience as well. Uh, I'm Pat Kelleher. I am the commissioner at the Maine Department of Marine Resources and the chairman of the Element Board. Sarah DeMeyers, director of Land for Maine's Future Program. It's um, wonderful to see you all. I need to cut into your speaking. <laughs> I'm Bob Myers. I'm a public member from Bath. Cameron Roberts, staff. Uh, Laura Graham, senior planner for LMF. Barbara Trafton, public member from Brunswick. Amanda Beal, I'm commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. Uh, Matt Hunter. Public member from Amherst, uh, new new member. I look like this. I, <laughs> I got to wear this because I was on two planes and three airports <laughs> yesterday, and who knows what I brought home. I'm Roger Burley, public member from Cliff Island. Catherine Robbins Halstead, public member from Searsmont. Now I'm Jim Connolly, sitting in for Judy Camuso, um, the director of. Bureau of Resource Management for Fish and Wildlife, basically the biologists in the hatcheries. So Jim. Um, and Jim Norris, public member from Winthrop. Perfect. Uh, actually, I'll come back to that Jason. One. Jason, Jason Bule, uh, senior planner for LMF. Um, those in the audience, if you could introduce yourself. Who are you? I thought that was God for some reason. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> uh, Jeff Romano, Mako Church Trust. I'm Liz Petresca, Director of Acquisitions and Planning for the Bureau of Parks and Lands. I'm Alex Redfield, Farm Viability and Farmland Protection Specialist for the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry. Lori Costigan, I'm the Chair of the Appleton Select Board. I'm Peter Beckett, I'm a Selectman with the Appleton Select Board. I'm Judy East, Director of the Bureau of Resource Information Land Use Planning with Ag Conservation and Forestry. Thank you, Peter. You don't sound like you're from Appleton. <laughs> <laughs> but I am. <laughs> uh, nine years uh, Jim Conley um, is the proxy um, without voting rights. Um, so um, if a commissioner has a member of staff come in on their behalf, um, they can participate in full. They just can't vote. So if you try to raise your hand, I will have a minute call. And Laura, how many people do we have online? We have, uh, yes, we have, oh, six online. Well, that actually includes me and Jason. So we have four <laughs> online that don't include me and Jason. Oh, actually, three, because that's Sarah also. So we have Jim, David Rodriguez, and Scott Isansi. Oh, and Holly Sheehan, that's four. Okay, great. And so, and you'll take note of any hands that are raised. I'll be monitoring for hand raises. Yes. Perfect. Um, we're going to move right along then to agenda item number two, um, which is the uh, actually the did we approve the agenda? We don't have that. No, we don't. We don't have to approve the agenda. Well, um, we should be approving the agenda. Um, everybody's had an opportunity to see the agenda. Are we all set with the agenda, Barbara? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just note one agenda item that I think deserves some attention. It's uh, 7C uh, stewardship funds. And this is, we all know, is the first time that we've been able to talk about stewardship funds and our role in that. And I, when things are at the end of the agenda, I worry that we may not have adequate time to really take a thorough look at that. So I just want to note that before we go into our meeting. Great. Uh, thank you, Barbara. We'll make sure we're saving time for that conversation. Um, any any other comments on the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. 
Uh, moving along to the minutes of the February 25th meeting, uh, everybody had a chance to review the minutes. Okay. Motion Second. to accept from Roger Burley, seconded by Catherine. Um, any um, any additional comments or questions on the minutes? Seeing none, is there any objections to the minutes? Seeing no objection, the motion passes without objection. Uh, and we will move right along to item number three, which is fund balances. It's kind of fun doing this in person. <laughs> right, I don't have to worry about um, violating some policy. <laughs> well, I always have to worry about that. Yes. <laughs> Remembering if people can see you or not. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So in your board packet, I have updated the um, spreadsheet that shows all of our status of funds. Um, so now you get to see it on one page finally, and that includes um, funds from our 2009 bond, our 2011 bond, and our new um, funding allocation um, of $40 million. So total, we have $41,586,226. And we are working very hard. If you go back one, no problem. Um, to spend down those 2009 funds, we're very close. And um, it's really just <laughs> a matter of closing out this project and paying for these legal expenses. So it will continue to go down rapidly. Um, and then I think our 2011 bond will also be going down very quickly as well. So expect to see those changes. Great. Any questions on on the uh, on this slide? Not no, seeing. there are none. No, there are none. None. Okay. And this is just a review of our water access funds. We do have a water access proposal in front of us today, so I thought it'd be helpful to um, review this a little more in depth. Um, I do want to point out there's a change from the green sheet you have. Um, Egamogan Reach and Mill Pond on the green sheet um, has an allocation amount of 210,000. That was updated by the board in their vote to 212,500 based on the appraisal. So we'll just make sure we get that <coughs> spreadsheet updated for the next board meeting. But wanted to make sure you had the accurate number. So um, from our previous um, allocations from the 2009 and 2011 bond funds, we have 207,000. 595 remaining in water access funds that are not allocated allocated to any projects. And moving on, um, so again, the spreadsheet in your um, board packet has not yet been updated with the five new projects. So I want to make sure your this information here on the screen is up to date with um, six active conservation and recreation projects three active water access projects and two working waterfront projects. So of the 41 million that we have, 4 million has been allocated towards projects. Can you remind me the working waterfront ones there? I'll let Laura do that. Oh, the ones that are outstanding? Yeah, yeah they are Carter's Wharf, which is just cycling through the last of the agreement back and forth thing. Yeah. And then there's the Jones Port, Henry's Point, Municipal which project. is yeah completely hung up on the appraiser they can't find one or no they've got one okay it's just not finished okay right. okay thank you thank you and we are hoping to have a couple of um, closings this spring that will include the Kennebec highlands um, by in a mountain project that you just selected in january schooner cove um, which is a our last round nine project, um, which would be fabulous to have that done. And then our St. George River Water Access Project. And I want to just give a, a shout out to the town. They've done a great job moving that project along. Um, and it will be wonderful to, to see them um, take ownership of that property and use it as a, a town property. That's going to be a heavily used access. I yeah, guess. and they've done, a, they've done a great job. They've been bird dogging that one hard yeah. and making good progress. Yeah, that's good stuff. No questions from online community. Okay. Is that it? That's it. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions from the board for Sarah? Seeing none, we're going to move on to agenda item number number five. 
um, get to the meat of the, the meeting here. Sherman Mills, uh, Sherman Mills Bond Water Access Proposal. Laura. Indeed. This is, as you see, the acquisition of a little over four acre parcel by Sherman's Mill Pond, 740 feet of water frontage. It is Sherman's Mill Pond is a great pond because although impounded, it is bigger than 30 acres. I looked that up right before. <laughs> uh, there are there's traditional been a lot of local use of this pond for generations. And thanks to the generosity of the current landowner, um, if you approve this project, that uh, access will continue. This project will, if the board approves it, become known as Getcho Park in honor of the landowner. Um, it has, uh, uh, it's only a mile from the village center. It has some parking on site already. It's got parking for like five to six cars. It's on a public road. It's on a main road. So access shouldn't be a problem. Uh, the total project costs, the landowner is willing to convey this to the town for $75,000. So the town of Appleton is looking for $37,500, which is a perfect match. Um, Jason, you want to go to the next slide? And here you can see where it is uh, from the air doing my best if uh, well, that's just a pretty picture of it across the pond. That house is just a pretty it's not part of the conveyance. Um, if you see on the if you see the pond there in the in the photo, the Google photo on the left and you see it looks like kind of a funny looking like thumb right hand thumb. The the boundary goes from sort of the road up up to that thumb and then it cuts like a I don't know. a 30 degree angle, maybe over to the pasture area. You can see it um, outlined in the far right uh, photo on the right is that you can see that little, hopefully you can see that little square spot. Um, yeah, and that's next, next slide, please. <clears throat> and so we have prepared a draft motion for the Sherman's Mill Pond Water Access Proposal with a preliminary allocation of 37.5 subject to standard LMF conditions. And I do also want to alert the board that this is likely to be a pre-acquisition sometime after today um, in, 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 in consideration of the landowner wanting to close things up. Um, and IFNW has approved this. IFNW said they're in support of this. The uh, applicant understands the risks. They bear all of them. If something goes wrong with this project there and there's not LMF funding, they understand that that would be their problem. Um, and so that may I just wanted the board to realize that may be a thing that they need to do uh, for this landowner. That's it. Any questions from the board for Sarah for Lawrence? Robert, I just have a couple of questions. So this is an impoundment and I wonder about the dam. And uh, who controls the dam? And is that uh, does that ensure uh, that the impoundment will like remain continue? Yeah, I have absolutely no earthly idea. Lori Costigan from the town of Appleton is here. She may have the answer to that question. Yes, um, the dam was actually created by Inland Fisheries and Wildlife um, decades ago, and it is not controlled by um, either. Both parties on either side um, have moved away from any sort of control of that dam, but it is part of a bridge structure that the town maintains control of. So in essence, if the town remains responsible for the bridge above, we're responsible for the um, impoundment for the dam, which is not, it is a, a stretch to call it much of an impoundment. It's, um, it's not very deep or cumbersome and the bridge work is the majority of, of what helps hold that back. So, and it's in good shape and you maintain that. It's inspected by the Department of Transportation um, every, it's on a, I believe a three year rotation schedule as, as many of the bridges are in the area. Um, and we do have a, a passing report for that and we do maintain it. Yeah, it's a very heavily traveled residential area. Just to follow up, maybe Lori, I should ask you directly, but um, just uh, the water quality of this impoundment. I, I noticed there's quite a bit of green matter in the photo, and you haven't uh, indicated that it would be for swimming or anything. It's more for boating. So water, uh, just kind of a general question about the water quality vis-a-vis -vis uses. Um, for uses, I believe that there is, it is currently used for um, fishing, 
and boating. Um, I believe there is hope for swimming and some people do swim in it now. It's not and they wouldn't. Um, it is not used for swimming for lack of um, regarding anything to do with the water quality. I think just traditional uses have been more specific to fishing and boating, um, paddling and, and um, you know, certainly not heavily motorized. It's it's more paddle boarding, kayaking, canoeing um, and smaller outboards. Um, that particular water body is fed by a um, by a bog area that it is it's in one of the slides um, and it has not, to my knowledge, and from what um, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has seen, it doesn't have any concerns. I'm not sure if that's specifically what you're looking for, but it hasn't closed for algae. It hasn't closed for anything like that. And uh, does the town monitor the water quality or is it the Bureau of Inland Fisheries? Um, they would have reviewed it years ago when when they last were there, but the town hasn't. It, where it's been in private ownership, the town has not. Um, you know, we don't have backlogs of the water quality, other than knowing that it's capable of being used and it isn't. Um, you know, there's there are no blooms, algae blooms. There's one other thing that's worth saying is that. The water does actually run through and over the dam, so there's constant refreshing of that water yeah. body. So um, it's uh, that's a good thing <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Not seeing any other questions. Would uh, oh, somebody Jim like has his hand up? Who does? Jim has his hand up. Jim, you're you're on the seal. You're in the ceiling. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question related to uh, have, is there a history of any milfoil problems, and is there a plan for or, or the feel that they might need some sort of uh, milfoil inspections? There is not history of milfoil. Um, there will, with with the access becoming um, part of the town's jurisdiction, there will have to be ample um, posting for people to inspect their boats, and just as as other boat launches in the area do. Um, and and the town is aware that that's something that we have to take on. Um, perfectly willing to do so, particularly okay. because it's a shallow water body. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Did you hear that, Jim? Yes, I did. Uh, you did a thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it's plug and play. It's okay. Um, any other questions? None so far. Nope. Um, I want to give the town before motions made. Give the town an opportunity to say anything else on the project that you might like to. We're just delighted to be here today, and it's we started in June um, when when the landowner sold a larger parcel um, in, that is adjacent to what you're seeing now. And the family, some of you might be familiar with the Getchell name because um, Dave Getchell, who, is, who has since passed away, helped create the Maine Island Trail Association. So um, when this, this sale became apparent, the fact that they hadn't sold the four acres, we approached um, Dory, who, who is Dave's widow, and asked if, if she had any interest in it being um, used by people forever, um, because certainly we've all enjoyed their generosity. And the answer was a resounding yes. So it's taken us a while to get here, but um, it's it's great to be here. And we certainly thank you for your appreciate and for your um, consideration today. Great. Thank you. I'd like to end. Barbara, may you make a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move to accept the Sherman's Mill Pond Water Access Proposal as a finalist with a preliminary allocation of 37,500 subject to standard LMF conditions. Second. Motion by Barbara, seconded by Roger. Any discussions on the motion? Seeing none, hearing none. Uh, are there any objections to the motion? Hearing none and seeing none, the motion passes. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. And so with that, we will move on to item number six, which is the access improvement grants. And we'll turn behind us to Jason. We're going to let you sit at the big boy table at some point. Yeah, that's not really what it is. Yeah.
<laughs> Wrong. <laughs> so yeah, uh, after the January board meeting, I sent out letters to the five projects that had closed last year, inviting them to apply for access improvement funds. And four of the five applied for a total of $45,232. And two of those four are requesting, are requesting the additional access adaptive access funds. And the breakdown of that uh, Caterpillar Hill project is asking for funding to add a parking area on the piece that they acquired, connect to an existing trail and turn that existing trail into an accessible trail. Rick Falmouth to start the parking area to provide access. On Cove Island, a combination of expanded parking at the boat launch on the mainland and um, trails on the island. And Sisladov, Sisla and Horseshoe Lakes to uh, build a trail at boat launch on Horseshoe Lake. So those are our four proposals. And the draft motion. Great. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, Jason, the parking lot for Caterpillar Hill, is that? Right near where the pull off is as you're driving over Caterpillar Hill? Is there is it connected or is it a se separate lot? I'd have to look at the, at the proposal to be okay. 100% sure. I think it's in, it's in that area, but I don't know yeah. if it's immediately adjacent. Trails okay. down over the hill. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, any questions for Jason? Barbara? Um, Jason, I, I'm looking at the word universally. Um, because uh, I've seen it before uh, to describe the Sunrise Trail. And in that context, we were told it means motorized access as well as pedestrian and non-vehicular access. I'm probably using it wrong. Uh, I, I am not implying, like what, it, it's an accessible trail is what is the point of it, is what okay. the way I'm using it. It may, it may not be the correct, the technically correct use yeah. I I just think it's important if we you know accessible seems like the better word here to me. Jim Norris has his hand up. Uh, yes, uh, the Cisladopsis and Hosher Lakes uh, request. Um, I, I'm concerned. I thought this uh, the the nature of the project would have already included uh, <coughs> costs for. Uh, the boat launch on Horseshoe Lake, and that uh, I'm not sure why it's a uh, an additional request. Uh, so the original project design did inc include the idea that this this would be developed. Uh, the initial award, though, was only for acquisition costs or the cost to purchase the land. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Questions, comments? Seeing none, uh, anybody like to make the motion? I'll do that. Um, I move to approve access improvement funding for the Caterpillar Hill, North Falmouth, On Cove Island, and Sissa Dobbs' and Horseshoe Lakes projects in the amounts indicated for a total not to exceed $45,232. Sure. Motion by Bob, seconded by Roger. Um, any comments on the motion? Seeing none, hearing none. Is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none, seeing none, the motion passes without objection. Great. Great. We run along. Uh, now we're getting into some of the uh, board policy discussions. And um, uh, 7A is a policy committee recommendations of topics and schedule. So I'm going to turn it right over to Sarah. Yep. Yep. So um, you will recall, I'm going to sort of bring you back in time a little bit, give us some context of where we are. Um, as part of the board's um, uh, process work group, this was a work group that was put together, included board members as well as members of the public you received a series of recommendations and we spent quite a few board meetings going through those recommendations and developing board subcommittees to address those recommendations. One of those subcommittees um, 
was tasked with taking on policy level discussions. And that group included um, Bob Myers, Jim Norris, and Don Kleiner, who is now termed out. So we have um, Bob and Jim um, who met with myself and Bethany Atkins from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and Liz Petruska from Parks and Lands. Um, we met on March 10th. And the objective of the group was to review the list of policy discussions that were identified by the work group and determine which ones um, would be a priority for the board to discuss and to set up a time frame or a schedule in, in which to do that. So that is what we did on March 10th. Go to the next slide. Here are the recommended topics and schedule for the board. Um, you can see today the March 22nd meeting. Um, their recommendation is that we talk about carbon credits and mitigation funds. Um, on the July meeting, we would talk about the role of the designated state agency and LMF project agreements. So that's two different topics. And then in November, we would take up easements and that includes um, there were multiple recommendations regarding easements, including um, templates and different tiers and the review process. So that is a um, that schedule is really a function of um, those board meetings in which the board is not already busy reviewing and um, scoring proposals and selecting finalists. So um, you are pretty well booked in May in September. <laughs> so this is what this is what's left. <laughs> and the intention is to really tee us up well for um, our next call for proposals, which I'm anticipating will happen late summer and early fall, depending on the program. So that is the subcommittee's recommendation to the full board for a schedule. And I believe in your board packet, you had the list of all of the board policy topics. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, any any thoughts? on this schedule and frankly the topics um i would look at that march 22nd one and kind of scratch my head a little bit on our carbon credits and mitigation funds um as far as um how much work we want to go into right now um, on that particular topic i know commissioner beal has brought this up do you have any thoughts on um yeah i i have a few thoughts but i'm sure others in the room will have some thoughts as well so the Far Forest Carbon Program Task Force met for several months um, and put out a report a couple months ago. And I do know that in that environment, we had a lot of discussion about uh, carbon credits and credit programs. And our understanding is that landscape is changing pretty rapidly. There are a lot of there's a lot of, you know, sort of evolution that's happening there. And we actually decided instead of putting forth any kind of policy recommendations around monitoring or interacting with those markets that we we realize that what we need is capacity in terms of expertise to better understand them so we can understand how they're impacting the work that we're doing, um, whether it be in forestry or, you know, natural lands agriculture. Um, and so I, I mean, I would just say that we're still, I think, in the same place of watching and trying to understand um, and as a result, in our supplemental budget uh, request, there are a couple of different positions that would give DACF more capacity, uh, both in, in the Bureau of Resource Information and Land Use Planning, Bureau of Forestry and Bureau of Agriculture to have some staffing, uh, or some staff that would have the bandwidth and the capacity and expertise to really be advising us on what's going on in this kind of a, an area. So um, I think if we were to talk about any kind of policy, we probably would want to keep it pretty loose and yeah, high level and to um, acknowledge that we probably are going to have to work through some projects to really understand the implications um, and to know that hopefully coming down the road, we'll have some more expertise within our department and in state government to help us understand what's what, what this landscape is looking like. Are you suggesting or implying that this might be premature and it may be better to do to have that conversation in November? I, I think to put together any kind of concrete policy that wasn't high level and flexible, we, we might be getting out ahead of ourselves. But um, I mean, it's a good it's a good realm for us to be aware of that there might be some intersection that we have to 
pay attention to, but I'm just not sure we would be ready today or we would have the expertise in the room and enough information to really put together a policy that we feel confident about. Yeah, I the intention for today is really just to be able to inform um, applications that you're going to be seeing coming in in May that have proposed to match with MNRCP, for instance, you know, and, and get a clear read from the board of is that is that eligible or not? You know, we we need to make that decision. Um, the details absolutely can get. We need more capacity to figure out the details, but we need to understand are we going to move forward um, as a program that participates in um, matching with mitigation programs? That's a, a question, a fundamental question we have to answer, yes or no. The details, we need that answer before May. The details of, of what that looks like, we have time. So, I mean, I appreciate that, but do we have the expertise? I mean, the, it, it sounds simple. Right, we're just going to create a policy on whether we're going to match or not match. Um, but there's some complexities to it that I'm worried that we might not have the expertise to really give us the guidance we need. I would suggest that we go ahead because staff have prepared documents in your board packet to to have yeah. the conversation and um, see if we can get to a point that works and completely recognize that this is going to be an ongoing topic that will intersect with easements. It will intersect with multiple areas that we have to to work through here in the next several months. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a, so the development would be an adaptive policy or a white paper that's going to give board guidance. And then is that what you're thinking? I, I, my sense is we can we can answer a few questions and recognize that there will be future yeah. discussion. Yeah. Okay. Robert? Sarah, can you remind me um, who's been particularly present at discussions on mitigation funds? I'm thinking of our partners, really, our cooperating partners, our conservation community. Um, I don't, we really haven't had a discussion at this point. I, what I can say is that there is interest from the applicant community to be able to allow a working, for instance, a working forest easement for the landowner to retain the right to also enroll that land in a carbon credit program. So we've seen um, applicants who have that interest and we have worked up a compromise that has worked to date, but I think it's, it's the kind of thing that the board really needs to examine and say, is this the right compromise? Is this a compromise you know, that, that we want to make? Um, I would say on the MNRCP side, um, there is some interest, I would say. It's a small group that has an interest in being able to combine um, MNRCP with LMF funds. Um, what we haven't tested <laughs> is we don't know um, how interested DEP as the administrator of those funds is interested, if they're interested in partnering with LMF. We don't, you know, at this point they they are, um, they recognize that the MNRCP program is complex and it has very specific mission objectives that they don't want to deviate from. And so if if partnering with LMF means they have to compromise, I think they'd rather just not and they'd rather just fully fund the project as it is you know they don't have match requirements they don't they can um, fully fund their projects so there there's certainly interest and i think it is a very good question to ask ourselves and and provide an answer to the applicant community jim has his hand up as well I, i'm sorry to cut up here if you have a follow-up question no. uh my question relates do, don't we have the ability currently to recognize in the uh, rating process, uh, some efforts on the part of applicants for carbon sequestration or <clears throat> plans in the immediate future so that uh, we <clears throat> we are able to uh, uh, <clears throat> give them uh, an incentive in that direction or or is this down the road for us? Our current scoring criteria um, really look at the land's potential, the land's ability based on a variety of different features. Right. It doesn't talk about um, what specific carbon programs are appropriate or what they accomplish or 
what they might do in addition to an LMF easement. That's not what we're looking at. Our scoring system doesn't look at that at all. It's really looking at what is the land's ability based on right. the natural features and the aspect of the property um, and not, um, it doesn't have anything to do with restrictions on the property. Thank you. I, I, I think that my point was just so that our our audience realizes that we are um, looking in that direction, whether it's specific or not yet, but it it's fundamental in what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Captain. Okay. Right now you're just thank you, Mr. Chair. Right now you're just looking for our feedback though on this topic and schedule later on in today's agenda is when you're going to be talking about the carbon credits and mitigation, correct? You got it. Okay. I'm comfortable with making a motion um, that we adopt the 2002 presented schedule um, for board policy discussions, and then we can get further Thank into you. it. Yeah. Motion yeah, okay. by Catherine, seconded by Roger uh, for adopting the 20, uh, 2000, excuse me, the 2022 schedule for uh, board policy discussions. Um, any objections? Not seeing any objections, uh, motion passes. And let's move right along then to um, 7B then. Laura. 7B, the appraisal subcommittee. Um, yes, and as you all may recall, uh, I'm calling them the first team, the LMF process work group, the initial recommendations <laughs> that we got back in January of 2021, recommended that we simplify and clarify our appraisal process. And there was a, a great deal of energy dedicated to that. Um, and as a result of that, the uh, LMF board impaneled the, uh, the work group. I'm calling them the work group um, that was composed of I, I facilitated. Sarah was there, uh, Jim Norris, Bob Myers, and Don Kleiner. And then Jesse Studley from Legacy Appraisals, Shelby Rousseau from Major Leagues Heritage Trust, and Tom Duffus from the Conservation Fund. We had um, tremendous discussions because there was a great deal of, of interest and energy around this, the, the difficulty, the complexities of our appraisal process. We had a tremendous, uh, great discussions around um, what it meant. We used the first team's initial recommendations as a jumping off point. And when we looked at them, we realized that they had inadvertently fully removed the appraiser's obligation to comply with a fundamental part of use path. Um, and so when we realized this, when when the when we had in the initial recommendations that the that the AOC could potentially remain fully in the dark throughout the process, but then have to defer to other bodies, we realized that was actually a violation of USPAP. But we talked further about the experiences people had had, and we came up with the uh, compromise, the proposal, the proposed new job description that you see in your packet, which um, redefined their purpose and role that in a way that makes it clearer, uh, I think pretty clear actually, that their job is to evaluate every appraisal against a checklist of, of items. And just so you all know too, um, the use path itself says, uh, by the way, and it doesn't say by the way, instead that this is a perfectly good checklist for people who are not appraisers to use. It's good for appraisers and users alike. And the critical thing to understand about this piece of the discussion is that the Appraisal Oversight Committee and LMF, LMF is an intended user, which is a technical important term that means something very specific to an appraiser and helps an appraiser determine how that appraiser is to write their report. With the intended user in mind, it must be written so as to be understandable. And so this is what we came up with um, and we highlighted, we just put a big old like whether or not they are they possess the skills and training to be actual appraisers. That's not their job. That's not their job. That's not their job. Mm -hmm. They are to evaluate and use the checklist that will be published so that there is a much greater uh, co coherence and predictability in this part of the process. Everybody should know their role. Everybody gets to stay in their lane. Um, and we also, I think I, I'm ready to go to the next slide. Thanks, Jason. And we also see my see begin puzzle piece. Then we got gathered. Now we're like we're building. You see, this is not subtle. Um, so <laughs> so um, then we talked about the eva appraisal evaluation process further and we talked we addressed those permissible outcomes. 
Um, there was a lot of energy around people not liking appraisers, brother, uh, uh, perceptual reservations because it sounds like they're holding their nose or something. And so, but we wanted to preserve the discretion that allows our AOC to accept something that substantially complies. They get it, they understand it, even if it's not technically uh, in compliance. And so we we came up with an accept with comments, and that means. And, and, and past AOC members have felt very clear that sometimes our feedback helps improve the product that we get. And there's sort of like this. And so we can still do that. They still have the authority to uh, exercise some discretion for substantial compliance. And we don't have to sound like we're objecting as we go. Um, next slide, please. And here we have an even fuller, nicer stack. OK, now, <laughs> finally, um, the, we, we had some discussion then about the appraisal standards themselves. The appraisal standards, I want to tell you all as a side note, have changed hardly at all. I was able to look at appraisal standards back to 2002 and, uh, and see how our, our add-ons uh, mirror very closely Yellow Book. And as I got to be, I had the luxury of immersing myself in USPAP and Yellow Book philosophy, <laughs> understanding. It was awesome. And so, and I'm actually not being snarky, but it really was wonderful to understand how these things fit together. Um, to understand that our add-ons look a lot like Yellow Book. And now I understand why, because like a Yellow Book evaluator, um, our AOC is not expected to be intimately familiar with that property. They're not expected to necessarily have gone there. And so that's why in Yellow Book specifically say, oh, but you have to provide yellow, uh, photographs because this evaluator is not ever going to have, ne will never have seen this property. They need this in order to understand what the appraiser's conclusions are. And so with that in mind, the uh, first team did an absolutely brilliant job of combing through our existing appraisal standards and pulling out the add-ons that we needed to keep. We added a few more for that purpose to make sure that the AOC as the intended user could understand what was in front of them. Um, and the final work product of that is in your packet as well as appraisal standards. Um, and I think that is, I mean, Bob, you're here. Jim is, Jim is there. I um, think that's it. That's all I have to say for presentation. The rocks didn't fall over. The rocks didn't <laughs> fall over. See how it all went from a puzzle piece to like, see, subtle. Um, yeah, I agree. It was quite a slog getting through this. <laughs> um, but I, I think, the, at least for me, the, the key element was the checklist. And, uh, you know, it, everything will be very transparent. We have something, everything's going to be the same looking at it. Um, you know, we had quite a discussion. It, Look back over the years, we rarely had an appraiser on the appraisal oversight committee. And we learned the hard way that it's not a very good idea to have one sometimes. <laughs> so um, I, I think with the checklist, um, we'll have the ability to very transparently and, and very simply, or not simply, but to go through an appraisal and say, this meets our standards and uh, we're ready to go. Yeah. And just a special extra shout out to, to Tom Duffus and Shelby Russo and Jesse Studley, who gave so much of their time to help us um, really kind of synthesize all of this from the point of view of, out of the land trust community and from an appraiser's point of view. It was helpful. Just Jim have his hand up. Sorry. He does have his hand up. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, um, I think we all should really show some special thanks to Laura. Um, she orchestrated this incredibly well and kept things going and took some initiatives when things bogged down just a little bit. So uh, we'll be very thankful for you all, to, uh, Laura. Thank you. Any other questions or praise for Laura? <laughs> I'm ready to go. I mean, I've got this use pad yellow book. I mean, I'm ready to talk about this to ask Jason. He's like, that's enough. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jim, and I would just praise Bob because I think you just simplified this for me saying it's probably not a good idea to have appraisers on the <laughs> AOC because uh, Maybe not even realtors. Maybe I should resign. Yeah, you've been okay so far. 
we'll, we'll have another box on the checklist for you. <laughs> but this this term intended users is a good one, and it's not our responsibility to pull comps and bring those in. Right. We shouldn't be, you know, we can comment on the comps that are presented to us, exactly. but um, we're not expected to do independent research. Okay. So I. That this is really helpful. Good, thank you. Good. Yeah, I, the checklist is a fantastic idea. I mean, I've been around the LMF board for long enough now to see some appraisers come and go off the AOC, mm -hmm. and watched it bog down and watched it as it morphed and changed with new members. Um, so, the, to me, the transparency and the I don't want to say it's simplicity because it's still they're still going to have to take the time to understand the appraisal. Right. But it, it gives it some clarity, I think, for the board to receive the recommendation. So I think, well, it's great. I, you know, considering how technical the, the appraisal business is, um, this really kind of simplifies it and it goes because there's an element of art to this, too. And and so with the checklist, yeah, everything's going to be the same or as close as possible to being the same. Yeah. Did, did you um, create the checklist or revise no, Laura the checklist. For the most part. You created that, yeah, so yeah. you'll be sharing that. Laura, Laura did just did about everything. <laughs> I, I had a little checklist I was keeping track of what she was doing. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so the checklist, to be clear, is a thing that will be for our internal use that will update as use PEP changes. We keep this up to date rather than having stale versions. And the idea is that our summary sheet that goes to the AOC will get into the staff will work it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And then that will get posted online so that everybody can see this is the review sheet. It will have some of the same highlight criteria. But everything will match in a way. There won't be any surprises of, oh, I didn't know you were looking at this. And the checklist, it's not that it can't be publicly seen. It's just that it won't be. We don't want to make the mistake of trying to fix for our appraisal. We're not telling appraisers how to do their job. And we know USPAP will change. Um, in fact, in a year, almost certainly, it just got extended to the end of 2022. But that's changes. So we're not trying to fix that for all time. The checklist is for our internal use, um, but the appraisal standards, those right. should stay. That, and that kind of is all through the lens of us as the intended user and say that for our purposes, does this meet our needs? Yes, no. Right. Can we, under, can we understand yeah. can we what understand we need? It. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, our, our land trust partners have raise the issue around appraisals and appraisal subcommittees for a long time. So I just want to see if there's any comments from any um, of our partners that are here or maybe online. I would say that this is encouraging. I mean, I've been tracking this for a long time. Um, I remember a decade ago when it used to be the appraisal review committee and the discussion at the time was to change it to oversight uh, to get that sort of appraiser perspective out of it that that the, that the committee was supposed to be lame and looking at at the appraisals and, and not appraisers uh, looking over the shoulders of other appraisers. Yeah, so I, I welcome this development. Okay, we're not seeing anybody online. Jim has his hand up. Yeah, I think uh, it's important for everyone to realize that um, our staff, um, the entire staff um, really digs in and can keep us on track um, and and off <clears throat> without getting uh, out of the uh, our real role. Um, and we're particularly thankful that they spend uh, that much time getting it prepared for us to take the kind of role that we play. So. Um, thank you. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, we do have two draft motions on the board. Um, would any member like to make a motion? Roger? Even with my mask on, I can do it, I think. Mm -hmm. To adopt the proposed new appraisal oversight committee job description, uh, redefining AOC purpose, role, education process, and permissible outcomes. Motion by Roger. We have second. I'll second. Second by Bob. Um, any discussion on the motion? No discussion on the motion. Is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none and seeing none, the motion passes without objection. 
and move on to a second motion. I'll move to adopt the proposed new LMF appraisal standards. Second. Motion by Bob, second by Roger. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, any uh, objections to the motion? Hearing none, seeing none, the motion passes without objection. Nice work to the committee and to the staff. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And Laura, I'll just um, help me to remember that we should post those to our website. Thank you. And also, I'm supposed to help you remember to give a big old shout out to our website. Oh, yes. <laughs> I will do that later. Thank I'm you. sorry. Okay. She just made a note. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Great Good job. work, folks. This is tough, deep stuff, and we've got more to go through, but I appreciate your hanging in there. All right, let's move right on to um, 7C, um, board topics, uh, and we're on stewardship topics. Jason? Yep. So, as you all know, last summer the legislature authorized LMF to award funds for stewardship of properties that are acquired with LMF money. I will not read the whole statute, but there's it's there. Three pieces that I want to make sure are on everybody's mind. One is it the requirement that the fund be placed in a dedicated stewardship endowment. An endowment is a term that is defined in statute. Um, this is different from the language that is used elsewhere in the LMS statutes where it talks about a dedicated stewardship fund. So that's a that's a distinction that the legislature has made with regard to these funds. The other uh, one being the funds are for use on the funded property. Um, again, that's distinct from from the language around, for instance, access improvement grants, which can be used on adjacent land as well. And as, as a reminder, even though the statute says 5% of the appraised value is the limit, the board has set aside an amount of 5% of the LMF award. So that's just a distinction to keep in mind. And of course, the requirement uh, for our $40 million is that all expenditures must be matched one to one, which obviously includes these stewardship awards. So the LMF staff, all three of us have put our heads together and come up with a set of sort of proposed process and rules for how to award this money consistent with this statute. Uh, first off, uh, something that everybody we talked to wanted was to be able to make these awards at closing rather than later. So we think we can do that subject to uh, working with procurement to, to figure out the exact mechanism. Uh, we do want to make sure they have a have an investment policy or to make sure they have it rather than to second guess their asset allocation. Right. And the match needs to be in hand when the funds are awarded either in terms of either an excess match from the purchase or an applicant's contribution to match and matching this contribution to the stewardship endowment. But we do think it needs to be in hand rather than pledged uh, when the funds are when the LMF funds are awarded and it can be. It can still <coughs> go into the endowment at closing. We just need some mechanism of saying yes, those dollars are there. It's this is not a fundraising target. Uh, and then the requirement that the funds be managed as an endowment fund in accordance with with the statute with the LMF money to be uh, preserved as principal and only the proceeds to be spent. Uh, with two exceptions, one being with approval from LMF director that for extraordinary expenses that there could be that some portion of the principal could be spent. And then part of that approval would be a process for, for replenishing that fund. And that is consistent with the statute. I'm not, uh, not going to make anybody look that up. The, this, the endowment statute does you know, say that the principal can be spent uh, under the conditions where the original donor is the language they use, but in this case, LMF approves it. Other one being that matching funds, stewardship match that's placed in the endowment is not, doesn't necessarily need to be subject to that same requirement to, um, you know, to preserve the principle. And the reason for that is met, our statutes define match fairly broadly as any, any other money that is spent on the project. So by virtue of being put of being spent on appropriate stewardship on the property. It's accomplished its purpose as match. Uh, one other comment on this bullet point. Um, we talked a little bit about whether 
it was appropriate to have the to have this full endowment requirement on some of our smaller awards, which might only be a few thousand dollars. And the conclusion that we came to was because the legislature used that term endowment fund in our statute, that that was what should happen with all these awards, regardless of size. Uh, other requirements that it, again, that it be spent on the parcels receiving LMF funding, but again, not specific, not necessarily something that's going to be required for the match because we have more flexibility there. Uh, we think stewardship, stewardship is a broad term. Uh, we're not we're not trying to basically any reasonable expense related to ownership and management of the property. And to uh, track this, we uh, think it's important that we get annual reporting if the recipient has done what they should do to, to fulfill the rest of this and put this in some some mecha has a mechanism they can account for it easily. It should be this should be a fairly simple report. And of course, if the property is transferred, uh, then the funds, the stewardship fund goes with it. Stewardship endowment, I should say. Uh, so those are sort of the and, this, the and we're not asking the board to vote on all of these right now. This is because we're still working out mechanisms um, and most of this is just to implement the statutory requirements, but wanted to let you all know where our thinking is. And the mechanism that we would be used for this for cooperating entities, you know, uh, land trust municipalities, it would go in the project agreement. We have a very, we have an existing mechanism that's very well suited to this. Uh, for awards to state agencies, though, we think it would be necessary to adopt a practice of recording a notice of grant agreement, which would be a practice that hopefully the agencies are familiar with by virtue of uh, other funding sources. So that is where we are with this with stewardship funds. Uh, there is a draft motion, but I'm sure there is also discussion. So. Great, thanks, Jason. Um, Barbara and I discussed some of these issues briefly, and I know I was going through um, what Jason had pulled together, and, and a few things came to my mind as I was reviewing it. But Barbara, I want to turn to you because I know you put a lot of thought into this. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, this is an incredibly exciting thing that we can enter the stewardship game, um, and. So I've tried to spend a little time looking at kind of the lay of the land in the stewardship world, and we're a little late to the party, <laughs> um, but I still think we're welcome. Uh, and so I think Jason's done a great job uh, kind of laying out a lot of the decision points that we have to look at. Um, but I think there are different opinions, <laughs> Jason, on <clears throat> how some of these things should be considered. Uh, you know, the timing, what counts as match, where the match goes, what can it be expended on, um, and, you know, and then also I'm cognizant of the role that our cooperating partners play in the stewardship world and their expertise. Maine Farmland Trust has dealt with stewardship, the Nature Conservancy for decades. Uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, I'm aware that the Land Trust Alliance is, has a very robust program. And so I think, you know, what I've, what I've learned is that this is worthy of a lot of discussion and I think worthy of involving some of our partners and hearing what they're doing. Uh, even to the extent we use language here, uh, I became aware in my early years, I did a library campaign and we set up endowments and we talk, we use words like principle and interest. That's not necessarily state of the art in endowment land anymore. You know, it's historic corpus and other things. And if you look at the statute, which I rolled off too, you know, there's a lot of language around um, uh, general economic conditions, 
possible effect of inflation or deflation, expected return from income and appreciation of investment. So it's a, so many of these entities have very complex uh, endowment slash investment policies that I think we need to be careful of as we move into this, that we make it possible for them to accept our funds and that they're consistent with what their investment policies are. So you just raised a lot of questions for me, Jason, and I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I think as we enter into this, even though it may be a small amount of money that we're allocating, uh, it's important for us to be respectful of all the stewardship work that's going on and hear from our cooperating partners, which we've done so well, I think, through our working groups. And I think we have the time to do that. So I was hopeful that we wouldn't make any motions or adopt anything today, but that we would give ourselves the time to hear from our cooperating partners and think a little more deeply on these issues so that we get it right. And even to the extent of this 5% in the October meeting last October, and I'll note that I was absent, the only one I've missed, Mr. Chairman, but um, there's a big difference between what the statute allowed us to do and what the board decided to do in October of last year. And Jason very kindly um, looked, I asked him what, what's the average um, award that we make, LMF board makes, or what's the median? And he gave me both figures looking back a little bit. And so I just did some numbers and uh, we have to realize that if the kind of middle there, I took 250,000. If we're just doing 5% of 250,000, it's 12,500. Even if we ask that the match be a part of that fund, so the total corpus of the fund was 25,000, it would only throw off, depending on the investment policy, $1,000 a year. And I think we can all recognize that's probably not adequate. Uh, it's a nice additive, but it's it's not adequate. So I, I would just suggest another thing that we should continue to think through, particularly for newer entrants into the stewardship game, smaller land trusts and so forth. Should we rethink and go back and look at 5% of the appraised value, which was what our statutory authority was. So I'm just raising questions that I don't really have the answer. I'm eager to hear what other board members think. But I I, I think as, <clears throat> as we enter this, we should get it right. And we have a little time to explore this with our cooperating entities and get some feedback and think these things through so that we become a good partner as we enter the stewardship business. Great, thanks, Barbara. Let's see a few comments from the board and, uh, as, and then open it up to see if any of our um, partner community has any comments as well. So we'll do the board first. Any comments, questions, concerns? I basically, I would echo everything Barbara said. I think it really moves us to get some uh, reaction from our cooperators about about this. Now, I also I, I know that land trusts, um, any accredited land trust, is already thinking in these terms because it's part of the LTA uh, world. But I, I wonder about uh, towns, smaller towns. Is this something that they routinely do, and uh, is this would this be complicated for them for them to take advantage of this program? So you have any thoughts on that from a town perspective? I, um, towns certainly do. Um, we usually do that through the Conservation Commission. That they have dedicated funds for their town-owned properties. I think staff's perspective in coming up with these considerations was really about keeping it flexible and keeping it easy. Um, that that was um, sort of primary in our in our thought process. Um, and I think you know. There is sort of the reality of keeping it flexible and keeping it easy and balancing that with 
feedback we're going to get from the AG's office and procurement and sort of, you know, we don't even fully understand the sidebars of in which we can participate. And so that's that's out there as well. And and that will be feedback we'll have to incorporate as well. Okay. Commissioner. Um, I just wanted to say I, I too, like Barbara, I'm really glad that this is even a discussion that we get to have because the stewardship side of protecting land is so critical. Um, and, you know, I think that it's I just want to say thank you to the staff for pulling together these considerations. I think this is really helpful and I always, of course, err on the side of wanting to get as much feedback as possible. So I think that would be a, you know good for us to to be talking with our partners. Um, and, and I too would be interested in revisiting that 5% uh, allocation and, and how we want to address that. So. Great, thanks. Um, any other questions or comments from the board? Let's, let's go to our um, partners. Is there anybody online that has, may have a comment, Laura? Uh, not as yet. Is there anybody left in our uh, there? One. <laughs> Any comments? Uh, I would just second, you know, Barbara's um, suggestion. I think it's it, um, it makes sense to take some time to make sure we get it right. Um, and I know, speaking on behalf of Mako's Heritage Trust, we're happy to to be part of any conversations and provide whatever expertise we can. And I'm sure there are others, large and small, that would do the same. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I. Having spent some time here, I want to appreciate, I do appreciate the work that the staff has done in particular, Jason, in pulling these things together. Um, it left me with a few questions. Um, and then when Barbara talked about kind of some additional outside input on this, it, it brought me back to the days when I signed off on the Machias easement, um, which seems like 100 years ago, almost 20 years ago now. And that actually came with uh, a million dollar endowment. Um, and endowments have really evolved. Stewardship has evolved over time. Um, I know even the list um, of eligible things with that could be done with the endowment, kind of like when I saw um, legal challenges, comma, et cetera, it left me with like, what's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you never find out. Yeah. <laughs> I've enough legal challenges without having to worry about that right now. but. Um, I, I do think it would be worth, I don't think it would actually take a lot of time. Um, um, having a few uh, members of the board and a few members of the uh, land trust community and, and maybe even somebody from a municipality um, that may um, have some experience here from a town perspective to just jump on a call or two, um, kind of finalize this and then um, come back to the board. It's not, I don't see, so I'll let Sarah correct me because she's good at correcting me when I uh, overstep, but uh, I don't think this is something we need done today or in the next month or two. I, I would agree with that, although I am having a little anxiety over um, our schedule. We have a very tight schedule. I think it would make sense um, for a subcommittee to form and report back to the board in July. That's our next opportunity to talk about policy um, discussion topics. So I think um, a subcommittee that could meet and come up with maybe fully more fully flesh this out for a July discussion would be good. If the intent is to make funds available at closing, we do need to figure this out sooner rather than later. We've got five projects right now that are going to close in the next, you know, six to 12 months. Yeah. And we're going to have maybe two dozen more landing on your desk in a, in a month. So there is a there is a bit of urgency. Take a deep breath. <laughs> I've, but I, to, I've been taking yoga. So I've <laughs> to but I do think, you know, if we can talk about this and get it more fully baked for a July discussion, that would work. Yeah, I'll, I'll volunteer to be part of that. Great. So we've got Roger, Barbara, anybody else on the board? I don't think we need, I, I'll tell you what, I would actually volunteer for this if, but my schedule is such a wreck yeah. that if if you can't, don't try to schedule around me. Um, if it's become a problem, if I'm available, I'd like to join. Um, any thoughts on? I, I'd be happy to be available for this. Okay. Today. And so Commissioner Beal as well. Yep. Any thoughts from the outside? Any in particular? Um, you and I talked about um, yeah, I Mark Berry from TNC. Mark Berry, I, I think, would be a wonderful addition to this group. He 
um, created the stewardship uh, plan for Down East Lakes Land Trust, also for Skudik Institute. And now he's at the Nature Conservancy and manager of stewardship there. So he just has a lot of experience. Um, and yeah. and even Jeff, even <laughs> <laughs> might be a good player just because he represents not only Maine Coast Heritage Trust that's been in this game a long time, but also the Land Trust Alliance. And and so I you know I think that's a name, Jeff or yourself or somebody from the I alliance. could figure somebody out. Okay. Yeah. I'd Thank like you. to also um, include either a municipality or a very small land trust yeah, in that mix. Yeah, I agree. We can um, help find the smaller land trust too. Yeah. I'm trying to think, didn't we do a project a number of years ago with the municipality that had an endowment? No. I, I'm sure we can come up with a couple okay. of different. Yeah. Main Community Foundation actually manages a lot of the trust funds that are set up for different state organizations, organizations yeah. including yeah. state agencies. They may be a resource since they actually do that for a living. Yeah, that's a that's a good that's that's a really good. I think we idea. we would probably want to because there are there may be some challenges um, in terms of how money flows through state agencies to Maine Community Foundation that we would be beneficial to have them engage yeah. and help us think through. We usually, we don't give them money. We get money. Right. Like it would come from LMF to. PNC has set up trust funds with Maine Community Foundation that feed money back to the state. The state treasurer is not really excited about having state money going in. No, that's they're gonna get that's, I think that's the Keller rule because <laughs> I took a million dollars and gave it to them so that came through TNC and then, and then they told me I wasn't supposed to do that. Anymore. And I just said, I'm sorry, and, uh, but they didn't make me take that. So it was all good in the end. Right. I, th I think including them would be good because we have already thought about like how, what is the mechanism to make that flow yeah. and how do you and how would we do that? It would be very good. That's an excellent suggestion because for entities that don't have any stewardship funds, don't have an endowment slash investment policy, don't have the capacity, Maine Community Foundation, you know, has provided that and it's a good resource, I think, for all. Sarah, do you envision that we could do this by Zoom or we would do it in person. The only reason I'm asking that is uh, thinking of trying to get Pat. It's it's a different scenario if we have an hour on Zoom or two hours on That's Zoom right. or if we're asking <laughs> yeah, people to drive. Uh, yeah, so. my sense is we can be flexible, you know, just depending on what what works. Okay, I think we've got a path forward. All right. Uh, that was a good discussion. Thank you very much. Let's um, let's switch back to carbon credits. Um, I tried to take care of all of that earlier, and um, because of my lack of sleep uh, from a puppy at home, I brought it back into clarity for me. So uh, let's. Um, uh, who's taking lead on this? Uh, that will be me. All right. Okay, so as part of our process work group, we had a couple of recommendations that. Um, uh, I have pulled together in, in a single conversation um, and the intent here really, as we kind of talked about earlier, this is a high level conversation. We're not talking about um, the actual implementation. It's just a board, you know, where are we at on this issue? Um, and this is important, as I've said, this affects um, projects coming up um, with the April 1 deadline. Um, and it affects um, certainly our working lands projects as well. So two recommendations. One is to update LMF policies and scoring criteria to reflect current state policy initiatives related to climate resilience and carbon sequestration. And the other is to look at um, a variety of different funding sources and um, sort of determine which of those are a good fit with LMF, including MNRCP. And on the second bullet, Laura has done this work and she's presented to you a document that kind of shows m m the sort of most commonly used project program funds. Um, so we're going to revisit a little bit of her work there. Um, 
So just to like sort of frame everyone in the, in the same place, um, regulatory ooh, go back. carbon credit programs and MNRCP are both compensatory mitigation programs. So they're, they are designed to compensate for actions that are inconsistent with state and federal land use regulations. They're compensation, they're not voluntary. That's an important piece to understand. LMF is voluntary. It's why we have a willing seller letter with every single application. Next slide. So the question is really, is it appropriate for LMF, which as I said, it's a voluntary conservation program to fund or accept as match those properties that have been or will be used to permit increased development, more intensive natural resource use, impacts or extraction than allowed by law or to provide regulatory mitigation credits for fiber, discharge of pollutants, et cetera, on land not subject to LMF funding. And if so, under what conditions? It's really a philosophical question. There is no right or wrong answer, and it's um, just a good thing for the board to understand where do we stand on this and why? 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 Why is that been our policy? Next slide. So our current policy and guidance comes from the Working Forest Drafting Guidelines for Working Forest Easements. This was a process that was undertaken in the early 2000s. And Roger, I saw your name as I was reviewing some of the past documents. You were engaged in some of that early discussion back then. Um, the board at that time, um, prior to developing the Working Forest Easement Drafting Guidelines, sat down, I can only imagine, and kind of mm -hmm. said, hey, what's what are our core values here? What's important to us? What do we want to see reflected in these easement guidelines? And one of the things that the board at that time felt was that the easement should specify that the development rights are extinguished and may not be used to augment development or other land uses on other land as might otherwise occur in cluster zoning laws, transfer of development rights schemes, and carbon sequestration and carbon dioxide credit programs. That's 2002 language right there. And um, based on that core fundamental, the board then developed, well, probably the staff, the board, <laughs> the staff developed and the board approved. <laughs> hey, that's a low blow. I'm just telling it like it is. <laughs> this is the language that we have since used in our easement template. Basically says that the development rights um, have been extinguished and you can't use the property to um, permit increased development or natural re resource use or removal on other land or to achieve other regulatory mitigation credits for fiber discharge of pollutants or other similar accommodations on land not subject to this conservation easement. So what that means is LMF's investment to protect a property cannot be used to satisfy a regulatory requirement. We, we are here doing voluntary work. You want your mitigation, that happens somewhere else. That's that's what it boils down to. Um, that's the that's the practice for the last 20 years. What we have come to realize over time is that there are times when what you envisioned for the property, you know, 20 years ago might change. And so the board has developed a change of use policy. And Bob, I think you were on the committee who who went through that and came up with that change of use policy. And that's that's where we look at, you know, how is the property being used? How is it intended to be used? And if we want to propose a change, you know, this is our process of of what we consider to to approve or deny a future change on the property. So that's what we have for forest easements. Jason, if you go to the next slide. In terms of fee properties, how have we implemented a similar kind of um, process? Our, uh, Jason earlier referred to our project agreements. This is um, a document that gets recorded at closing with every single one of our properties, whether it's fee or, or easement. And it talks about um, LMF's obligations, the designated state agency's obligations, and the landowner's obligations to that property forever and ever. And the language that we have in there is that the premise or any interest therein, and that's the important part, 
um, a, a carbon um, program would be an interest in the property may not be sold or transferred without prior written approval of the DSA and the LMF board consistent with the rest of the document. So this prevents any future conveyances. This prevents um, a landowner from enrolling in a carbon program. It prevents them from um, issuing a right of way. It, it prevents them from selling um, uh, mineral rights or water rights on the property that has LMF in funds invested in it. Um, and again, we have our amendment and change of use policy and, and all of this ties back. These are all about future conveyances. You know, this is all about when LMF puts its money into it, the, the rights are going to stay the same and the property um, uses are going to stay the same forever and ever. We do have the ability and, and do at times um, anticipate conveyances, you know, post closing conveyances. We um, try to avoid post closing conveyances like a right of way, but we can anticipate that oftentimes um, a town will acquire a property with LMF funding and at closing an easement if of no value is granted to a land trust and we we accept that that land that that easement is going to to occur at closing and we're okay with it. You know, it's it's there to protect um, the state's interests as well. So that's a little bit of context in terms of how we do things and why we do things and why we have done them the way we have. Um, next slide. I provided to you a recent experience we had with the grassy pond conservation easement. This was a round nine project. We got about 90% of the way through the project and the easement terms and negotiations. And the seller said, oh, wait, we want to, we still want to be able to, to do carbon credit programs. And it was sort of like, oh, well, we should have known that up front, <laughs> not three months before closing, because we don't allow that. Our, our working force easement guidelines clearly prohibit that. And rather than wanting to tank the project, because it was a great project, um, as a director, I, I took, and I will accept full responsibility, the um, position that, okay, well, let's, let's really parse out the language of our policy and what we're talking about here, and came to the conclusion with the help of our attorney that our current policy did not prevent voluntary carbon credit programs. It, it prevented regulatory programs. And so for the Grassy Pond project, we made an exception and came up with some language that would allow the property to be enrolled in a voluntary carbon credit program. And there are caveats and provisions um, that, that we put in there um, to ensure that any practices would be consistent with um, the easement and wouldn't um, violate other LMF sort of policy provisions. And this was something that the designated state agency agreed to, LMF uh, um, agreed to, our attorney said, I think you're good here, <laughs> and the landowner was able to agree to. So this is our one example of um, a recent project where we have um, acknowledged and granted the enrollment in a voluntary carbon program. Next slide. So now we're going to switch tracks and talk about MNRCP. And could, uh, sorry. Sure. Could we go back to that one for yeah. a second? Yeah. Uh, the actual uh, selling of the carbon has not happened in this case. You simply said you can do it under these circumstances. I'm not aware that it has happened. Okay. I, I haven't heard that that's the case. So just one one thought is that the uh, in the in a lot of carbon projects, there's an assumption made that the uh, that the owner could take away a whole lot of as much of the of the carbon as legally allowed. That sets the baseline, and that allows pretty generous compensation about if they're if they're going to manage the land to a standard much higher than that. I would assume in this case that the baseline would be significantly higher than the 
you can take away all the trees that are, are legally allowable. And that would actually significantly reduce the compensation that the, that the owner would get for participating in carbon. Is that? Does that, that make sense? A, the, it makes perfect sense. And I think that's a good assumption. We have not, and this gets back to Commissioner Beals, you know, kind of comment that we do not currently have and it is not really appropriate for LMF to be engaged in that end of it. Um, so, um, yes, they have to, whatever their practices that they have undertake have to be consistent with the easement terms. Do the easement terms allow them to, to, to undertake a, a complete clear cut? No. Um, and those details of what gets covered by the easement terms from LMF's perspective versus what gets covered under the carbon credit program are the devils in the detail that we don't have at this point in time, you know, and, and we don't have a way to measure or, you know, um, establish. So that is sort of the, the next conversation. Is there any concern about where the money goes for the carbon credits, as in if you had a significant land trust or conservation organization, and they were able to manage the forest management practices to create a carbon benefit, and then use that money to fund a stewardship fund that would generate long-term benefits in terms of protecting the property. Would that be a more desirable outcome than someone using it to fund some other purpose not related to conservation we did think about that and in this instance again this was an easement so there was a private landowner and a land trust and um this particular land trust was able to negotiate that any proceeds would be split between the landowner and the land trust and it had specific language of how the land trust was to use their proceeds so this land, this land trust has thought about that and has developed their own policy. Um, I didn't feel like um, um, I was in a position to try to negotiate with the land trust on what they did with the proceeds. You know, I felt like it it was right to let them make that determination for their own land trust. I don't think we would have an argument to negotiate that if we're funding the project. Not in that situation. I, I didn't feel it was appropriate in that situation. It's a private landowner with a land trust, and yeah. they have a relationship. I think that it's a different scenario if yeah. LMF is buying the fee. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it's a yeah. different kind of conversation. Okay. It, is there a benefit for the board in terms of choosing which projects to fund and creating a scoring incentive to do something that is judged to be more valuable to the purposes of the board in how those funds are used. I think you're like three conversations down the road and it's a good consideration. I just want to get the board to like, do we want to do this <laughs> first? <laughs> but yeah, I think that's, a, I think that's, that is a, the sort of yeah, logical next conversation if, if the answer is yes. So my concern is, and I may not, you know, have full grass and maybe discuss later on, but is that there's a working forest easement, which working forest easements, the understanding is that it's going to be sustainably managed and harvested. And then that stops because then they sell the carbon sequel. And I realize that you can get carbon credits and harvest, but it's, a, how are we going to say like, okay, you have to maintain the harvesting because then if we do the layer of working forest, which is great, I'm hundred percent behind working forest. I am also behind careful carbon sequestration as long as there's sustainably harvest levels in it. But some don't do that. Some completely lock up all harvesting. And that I think runs counter to working forest easements. And I have a problem with that. So I mean that is really getting into the weeds. Yep. On and we will and we will have to get down into the weeds yeah. eventually. And that gets back to sort of Max, Max point and my point is sort of what it what are we expecting the easement to accomplish? And what are we expecting the carbon credit program to accomplish? And I think we need to be very clear going into it of what those expectations are. I'm not trying to get us to that point today at all. Liz had her hand up. 
I was just going to follow up on what Jim was saying in terms of, of um, providing direction about where proceeds could go and just thinking about some of the larger uh, landowners that we work with and, and that potentially being problematic. I, I think um, we've been thinking a lot about what Catherine just said, but also trying to view carbon as another like forest product, um, especially in light of the really challenging um, timber market. So I think to say to a forest landowner, okay, like if you cut the trees, you can use the money for every anything. <laughs> We're not going to get in your business there, but if we do carbon, it has to be used um, for a specific purpose could be problematic. And I think I think that is true and the board should be really thoughtful in your policy. You know, there are things that the board has said. We understand that some large landowners don't want to provide public access, but this is fundamental to LMF. And if you want to participate in LMF, public access is a requirement. You know, there are just some decisions you make that this is so important to us that it's it's OK if some landowners don't want to participate. And that that is your role to make those kinds of decisions. Yeah. To Catherine's point, though, it might be interesting to go back and look at the enabling legislation of LMF and look at what the underlying purpose of a working forest easement was, if there's any indication about that. There's not, but what we do know, which is interesting, and Mac and I have chatted about this, we do have legislation that makes it very clear that the LMF board cannot acquire um, forested land whose primary purpose has been as commercial timberland um, and continue that as its primary purpose. So that is where we have things like public access and ecosystem services. And, you know, we cannot be out there funding land that has been commercial timberland and will only continue to be commercial timberland. It has to have those added public value. So that's that's really the only guidance we have. <laughs> and, and the statutes don't provide any guidance on um, you know, regulatory versus non-regulatory. It's very clear about willing seller and that the seller must acknowledge and all that, but we don't really have any statutory guidance about what we should do about regulatory, you know, regu compensatory mitigation. And the nature of our working forest easements uh, that, we, that we currently have, you know, and I'm sure they, they have lots of language about maintaining good stewardship as in not excessive harvesting, et cetera, et cetera. But do, if you had a change of ownership uh, and the new owner didn't want to cut trees at all, I mean, they'd have issues with tree growth tax law, perhaps, and, and things like that. But from our perspective, would they, they no, be a problem? Our working forest easements and our ag easements are um, all sort of, um, to keep the property available for commercial uses, but not to require those commercial uses. <clears throat> Good questions. Um, so if we are ready, we can sort of shift over to MNRCP. Um, again, for folks, this is a program that's um, administered by our Department of Environmental Protection. It's um, a whole framework in conjunction with several federal um, agencies and the state has put together a plan that justifies you know why we do what we do and how we prioritize projects within Maine and so there's it, they have their own framework imagine them like a whole other LMF you know they have their own workbook and their own all their own regulatory guidance so um, as part of Laura's review, um, looking at different funders that LMF could match with, she concluded, and the full analysis is in your in your packet, but she concluded that LMF could be compatible with MNRCP if the following conditions are met. One, this conversation right here. Do we want to <laughs> participate with MNRCP? Because our current our current guidance kind of leads to no. Um, MNRCP would have to accept LMF's em emphasis on public access, hunting, and trapping. So LMF's core fundamentals couldn't change as a result of participating with MNRCP. I don't think that's a, I think that's an easy bar to meet. 
there would need to be a mutual willingness between LMF and the MNRCP to tailor our project agreements to anticipate a process upon transfer or disposal. So that means typically LMF. Uh, OK, let me give you like a, a fake example. Howard Hill. Right here in Augusta, the city says, forget it. We don't want to use it anymore. It's going to we're going to turn it into housing development. There would be a process by which they would have to return LMF fun funds to LMF. That's spelled out in their project agreement. If MNRCP were involved, they would have a project agreement and theirs would say, you need to do a replacement property. We don't want the money. We want you to replace it with a different piece of property. So th that's a conflict that we currently have. The board can waive the funds and say, well, don't give us your money. Just put, put, you know, go buy that other property and Maybe we would say the board would want approval of what property they chose. You know that you may you may could have a role in determining what that property was. So that's something we'd have to harmonize. We'd have to make sure that we can both agree on a process should that unlikely circumstance happen. Um, and I would prefer that we get that figured out on this end of the acquisition rather than defer it for 40 years and have some other board and some other poor director have to figure out mm -hmm. what that process is going to look like. <laughs> I don't have input on it on this end. And then the fourth um, piece that would need to be um, worked through is the identification of a mutually acceptable designee as an enforcement alternative. So currently MNRCP uses appropriately, the Department of Environmental Protection. They're the entity who steps in and sort of attempts to um, remediate or resolve any violations. They're, they're so like the buck stops with the DEP. We don't partner with the DEP. We partner with IFNW, Parks and Lands, Main Historic Preservation, Bureau of Ag. Those are our designated state agencies. DMR. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and I think it would be appropriate that that we would continue that. You know, that it um DEP does not um act on behalf of the board or act on behalf of the sort of resources that we seek to protect. It's it's our designated state agencies. And again, I think that's not a high bar. I think DEP could agree to that. It's whether the designated state agencies want to take on that responsibility. That's, you know, they're they're currently taking on that responsibility with all of our project agreements, but it's something they would have to agree to. So those are the four bars that would we'd kind of have to make sure we could um, logistically carry out the the fundamental question still remains. Can you go back quickly to the slide that says uh, how we do this in principle now? Yep. Right there. So this in is in practice. Right? Well, no, 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 no. Okay. So th this this is easements. That's your easements. And right. the next one is fee. Okay. There was some line. Can go back one though. I want to just point out so. Too far. Right there. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is for easements. Consistent. And this does apply. MNRCP funds are used for easements. They can be. Yeah. They can be. I think they do more fee than easements. There was a there was a slide that talked about it was a chicken or egg question, right? It's like the land. It's it's the use of LMF funds cannot. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's in. This is one of the first slides, I think. Is it the key to be used on the plains outside? I think that's after this one. Uh, at the very end, you have that key question. Yes, I bring that bring that yeah. question back. Good segue, Pat. Good segue. There we go. Okay. So LMF as a voluntary conservation program to fund or accept as match those properties that are regulatory, compensatory. Right. That's sort of part of the question. Yeah. So I guess where I was going with that, it's a chicken or egg question. It's like MNRCP did that. that They're is the ones that allowed the, the developer developed the land, paid into the MNRCP fund. The NRPC fund is the MNRPC fund is now purchasing a new piece of land to offset the impact to the environment. Right, all of that was done. 
we're just we're, we're just becoming a matching agent. Well, um, so they are, what the question is, will LMF participate in the MNRCP acquisition? Well, is it is it OK for us to put our money into a regulatory? Requirement, I, I guess I, I understand that. I guess I'm not looking. The regulatory requirement was taken care of by the action of MRR, MRCP. And, and we are and being asked to participate in it. Right. Well, we're, we're, yes, I mean, I understand that, but participating in a way mm -hmm. that's not kind of related to the actions that have taken place. Correct. Only, only as a funder. I, I think I, it, I've been thinking about the same thing, and I think I can illustrate it with some Imagine there's a developer wants to do X, and they've been required to protect 100 acres. Uh, LMF matching might bring that to 200 acres, but it wouldn't reduce the original developer's right. uh, need to protect the 100 acres. We yeah. so we would not be helping the developer reduce their burden. We right. would be. That is what we are talking about. We yeah. are. That is that is the scenario we are talking about. We yes. be reducing the developers. We, it, it, that is part of the conversation. Yes. Oh boy, uh, that changes got Jim and then Barbara. <laughs> As somebody that's actually done yeah. both, um, I would offer this. I acquired four parcels of land for the department at Spectacle Pond using MNRCP money. I don't know who created the liability to the fund what they did or how they did it or how that fee was assessed. I had no connection to those projects at all that generated those developments. I had no responsibility for approving, disapproving, modifying, or any connection to them. Their payment to the fund was through DEP going through the state environmental review process to judge the appropriateness of that project. So I was separated from that. They paid into the fund and they walked away. And that was created by the core and the state of Maine in order to address the inability for developers to adequately mitigate for projects in all circumstances. And so there was a negotiation to create that process. The developer meets all the standards for avoidance, minimize, and then mitigate. There's an assessment for that. That's all handled outside of anybody that would benefit from the in lieu fee program. Right. Now contrast that with another project where um, DOT needed to mitigate for vernal pool damages at their paint shop here in Augusta and also Camp Chamberlain. And we worked with them to acquire a property out on Route 3 that had vernal pools. We actually were an agent in acquiring that property. Now, in that circumstance, if DOT was only going to give 150,000 and the property cost 300,000, and we were asking LMF for the additional 150, I think you would be doing what Sarah said. Right. We're actually enabling mm -hmm. that development because the developer couldn't do it without our action. In this case, DOT needed to mitigate at a certain level, and so did the National Guard for Camp Chamberlain. And they actually acquired that property adjacent to our management area. We negotiated all of that, and all of that money came from the developer. So in a sense, yes, we enabled that project. They had to mitigate, and that mitigation was determined by the state. By participating, we did. Right. If we tried to use LMF money, we actually would have made something happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And I think that's the distinction between yeah. MNRCP and what Sarah's pointing out here, where actually a developer can't make their project happen and properly mitigate it without taking public funds and bringing it into that activity. And I, I agree. I think that's a so different. It doesn't focus. reduce their cost, but it does open the gate to viable projects. That I, I, yeah, I want to ask a clarifying question to Jim. I think in the first scenario, the developer has paid in according to what DEP has told them they have to pay in. Correct. However, 
those funds are now being used to meet the required mitigation. So there's been an impact, you know, X number of acres impacted and DEP is tracking those credits. We now have to make up X number of acres because of that impact. And LNF would be participating in that action if we are matching. We would be participating in making, allowing that mitigation to happen. Barbara and then Amanda. Um, and Jim can correct me, but my understanding of the MNRCP was that early on it was a one off. You know, if you were going to do damage, you had to find a piece of land that mit mitigated, but it evolved so that there was a financial settlement for doing damage and it went into a fund and all the funds were commingled at that point. It's not just like this is from this project and this is from they're this project. But within a region. Yeah, they're co-mingled and I believe the Nature Conservancy administers these funds and then asks for proposals. Yep. And the intent was that they would then have, instead of just taking a piece of land that didn't really have significant values and so forth, they would allow for a robust process that then evaluated the significance of the land and and then all over the state, you know, invest in properties of significance. So all while make meeting the credits that they have to meet. So they DEP and EPA do track the wetland impacts and there is a one to one compensation for impacts. That's why you'll see MNRCP sometimes say we're targeting vernal pool projects because we have a lot of vernal pool credits we have to compensate for. Or we're looking for this particular um, wetland type in this particular biophysical region because we are lacking those credits. So there is there is absolutely a credit system to to mitigate for specific wetland impacts that are made in the state. They do have a very robust, very good process. Clarifying question, maybe. So my understanding is the developers have to pay a certain amount. That's it the is, fee. Right, and DEP kind of calculates it and tells them. And they pay that amount no matter what. And so if there was some kind of a project where both MNRCP funds were being leveraged and LMF funds were being leveraged, that doesn't let the developer off the hook on that what they have to pay. It just means that whatever isn't coming out of N MNRCP could go toward another type of project. Um, not necessarily. I mean, it's not going to that funding is isn't going away. So I guess I the way I look at it, we're, we're, LMF wouldn't really be helping the developer in any way to meet that whatever the we're the, helping the state meet its obligation under this under the framework the sure but the, it's all right so but those funds are there and they're there to be used for other types of projects that would be you know in alignment with what mnrcp is trying to do so yeah, yeah. yeah. under mnrcp the developer has had to meet all of the state standards, the public standards in terms of the benefits and the options and minimize and viewscapes and, and traffic impacts and environmental impacts, all of those things and follow the standard protocols. And that project is going to go forward if it meets those standards, no matter what happens on the other side of in loop fee. And right, they, when they complete that project, they get their permit and they've done whatever. And it, 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 it includes avoid and minimize. They don't get a, a pass because you're going to put money into in lieu fee. You don't have a lower standard. It's just another way for that developer to meet that mitigation requirement. They could go out and do a project on their own rather than pay an in lieu fee, but it's typically way more expensive and difficult to do. But at that point in time, their obligation ceases. And if no one ever took in lieu fee money, then I think they would rethink the program because it's not accomplishing what they set out to do, which is to eventually replace those impacts. But there isn't a connection, and not participating isn't going to stop development in the state of Maine. Um, Could I just ask a practical problem? And that's how often. Do our applicants ask or have they asked to use MNRCP funds? Every funding cycle. 
Okay, so it it's a ongoing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we have participated. I want to be really clear. We have participated in in MNRCP funded projects previously. Um, I I'm not sure the board knew that they were doing it. But does it really make any difference? It I mean, does. It does if you look at those four things. It, those are the things that really make a difference. You know, if we end up in a position um, where the board says, hey, this property is not, you know, is no longer useful. We want our money back. If we've entered into an agreement that prevents you from getting your money back, that that makes a difference. Okay. Your second example made me a little uncomfortable, but, but I think the key there is that um, the matching of the uh, the DOT funding and and uh, was that IFMW funding to get the burn pools out on room three that that just basically uh, provided an opportunity to do a very logically significant justifiable project um, and that's good. Yeah, I, I think it's you could view it at two levels. In that case, DOT funded the entire thing, and all we did is act as a recipient for the property and long term holding and stewardship of it. I think the difference in and probably the key point that I would offer is that if the de the developer could not in any way meet that mitigation requirement and they're using public funds. That's the piece that usually triggers the US Fish and Wildlife Service and other folks from looking at that in a negative light. They're saying, this is your obligation. You pay for it. You can't bring us in and use public money to accomplish your obligation for private development. And I think that's the piece that we're parsing out is when do you cross over to bigger and better? And when are you satisfying a, a personal corporate liability. That's exactly what I have problems with is that issue is using public funds to satisfy a private obligation for development. The first the first scenario you would list out when you were listening to scenarios, I was completely fine with that. Um, that makes absolute sense. But the second one, that little segment with public funds for private development obligation, um, I do have a problem with that one. Um, and I'm interested in staff feedback. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I would say I don't think LMF has ever, at least to my knowledge, participated in that second. I don't think we've ever received a proposal like, and I think it would come from a, a state agency. That's the only thing I can anticipate. So I don't. Potential is there. Is what uh, you're um, is a concern. But. Based on our current policy, I think the potential is not there. Okay. Um, and I don't think we have done that. Um, my perspective, and this is kind of what I said to to Pat going into this, is there is not a right or wrong answer. It's really just where, how does the board feel about it, it and making a conscious decision about it, and and being clear about that decision. That to me, that's that's the best outcome. Yeah, I think so there's there's two. Th I mean, obviously, there's I think staff is looking for kind of a a, a short term flexible policy to use Commissioner Beeley's term um, on how to deal with the issues that we have in front of us today. And then Jim and others brought up these kind of longer term in the weeds questions that I think are going to need more time. And hopefully with any success with the budget, we'll have some much more, um, uh, much more experience within the agency um, to help us down that road. I know being a member of the MNRCP board that does not participate a lot because of my schedule, um, I do know that the value of developers paying into that fund and the one to one replacement is really uh, a strong, strong program. We actually just created another program with DOT uh, similar to that for Atlantic salmon impacts. It's not gotten off the ground yet, but we did it with DMR the core um, to create another one of those programs. Here to me, I would hate to lose the opportunity to match MNRCP and MNRCP funds. If we had a project that is of major significance, 
that additional dollars from LMF could benefit. So I'd like to be able to make sure we maintain that flexibility going forward myself. I agree with that for sure. Mm -hmm. That's important. Yep. It's just the uh, into for as long as uh, we're not reducing the burden on the uh, developer. Exactly. Exactly. So with that in mind, and I'm going to look to staff, are you, do you have enough guidance from the board then with that conversation from board intent um, to move forward in a way that remains flexible? So if we were approached by somebody um, that was seeking MNRCP funds as well, that we could engage on those type of applications. So I think what, it's two steps I think that we could implement. The first is, um, Jason, if you can go back to the um, sort of four. Yep. I think staff can work on a conversation with DEP and the core and make sure that we can accomplish these things here, because if we can't accomplish these things, it's a different conversation. Um, if we can accomplish this, then I think that's a that makes it much easier to yeah. participate with MNRCP. And then the second thing I think staff can do is that when you are scoring proposals, flag for you, you know, part of their funding is MNRCP funds. And, you know, to, to just to bring it up to that, you know, consideration level as a consideration. So next step is conversation with DEP and the core. The core yep. is going to be the, the core is good. I found that the, the process has been had more rigid. So the EPA, I think we need to bring the EPA as well. They have some. Yeah. And um, we've already had conversations with the AG's office between um, the AG that represents DEP and LMF, and they have agreed in concept on this is what would have to happen. And everybody, so long as their priorities and their mission isn't interfered with, they're very comfortable working through these things. I wonder, Sarah, if because we have here the threshold determination of, of LMF's relationship to the use of mitigation funds, if that's overly broad, given this discussion, we, we massage that, that actually perhaps our threshold is no public money for private, you know, something else. As like more specific. Yeah. Yep. So the MNRCP is not knocked out of the bat. Right yep. out of the bat. <clears throat> and they actually were one of the also flag, you guys need to make this threshold determination. Are we going to be yeah. acceptable? Um, I think I think that's a good first step. And I think it gets us moving on something. I think we still kind of have the open question on um, uh, carbon credit programs and the same principle kind of applies in terms of regulatory versus voluntary. And that it's a similar concept that we have to kind of understand and get comfortable with. Um, I'm okay sort of pausing there and just moving forward with MNRCP. I think this issue is gonna come back up again when we talk about easements. That's another one of our policy discussions, and, and that's where we see a lot of this consideration for carbon credits is with easements. So well, let's eat this elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's the right approach. Does everybody agree with that? And I, and I would also say it's not any mitigation funds. One could imagine a different scenario. It's For me, it's specifically MNRCP because I know how it's managed and I know there's an arm's length. Right, between I think that's what Laura was sort of, yeah. there may be an so opportunity to refine yeah. a little bit to I could clarify imagine what taking, we are comfortable with and what we aren't. Taking a different position on mitigation different. funds in a different scenario, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay. Great, so we'll I think that was a great discussion. Yeah, a really good discussion. Um, we'll let staff come back to us on that. And I think that covers this topic. Um, so that moves us on to agenda item number eight, which is staff updates. Yes, yes Sarah. Um, okay, so these are notifications that came to you. There's no board action needed. It's just to keep you in the loop. Um, we had been approached by um, Lake George Regional Park 
um, regarding some uses on their property. This is actually a property owned by BPL and they have an agreement with um, Lake George Regional Park, which is so it's uh, run by a different entity than the state. They will be um, hosting the main Appalachian Trail Club to um, use the property for temporary housing um, this summer and there will be some sort of like work exchange. They'll, they'll get something out of it <laughs> for doing that. Um, BPL provided a memo just sort of saying we've looked at this and we feel like this is consistent with the um, intended uses of the property. So that memo went out to you. Um, we, I'm gonna jump down to heads of estuaries. This was another action that the board had previously approved. Um, this is a transfer of lands from one organization to another that has now been completed. So this is just letting you know that action you approved in 2019 has, has now finally been completed. And the last one was a letter of support from Woody Wheaton Land Trust. Um, they're very supportive of the, of the project. However, they would like to see some additional um, conservation happen as part of the project. Um, this is a situation of we have a willing seller and a willing buyer, and this is the deal that they agreed to. And <laughs> typically the LMF board does not intervene on sort of project design, um, but we can talk about it if there's interest in talking about it. You're waiting for me to tee off, of course. <laughs> um, it, does this request have the support of the applicant? Um, I think that's a good question we could pose to BPL. They're here and they're prepared to talk about it. Yeah, thanks. Um, no, I mean, I, 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 we really, really appreciate the land trust letter of support um, kind of generally for the project. I think as we referenced in our application, um, this project, the East Grand Weston project has over 21 miles of shore frontage and it includes kind of the last remaining undeveloped shore frontage in the town of Weston. And so, um, it was actually very intentional um, project design on behalf of the conservation fund and with the support of the bureau um, to work with the town to carve out some areas um, for future development to help balance um, uh, the impacts of conservation with with that tax base need. And I, I think it was a very thoughtful process um, in terms of really like getting into looking at soils and, and things like that. Um, and so it's not something we're interested in revisiting at, at this point, and we're we're too far along in the project <laughs> to be able to do that. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I think we can move on unless there are any other comments about these notifications. Seeing any? Jim blocked that. Jim has left the room. Okay. I don't know if he had to be someplace else at noon or if he's going to pop back in. Great. We'll move on. Check my email. There's no SOS. Okay. So um, just a couple of brief updates. I'm going to start by saying thank you to Courtney Marcelletta, who is our um, person who updates our website. She has been super helpful to us. We have made some changes to the LMF website hopefully making it a little easier and more intuitive to our applicant community to find, you know, how do I apply and what funds are available. So thank you, Courtney, saying that publicly because we really do appreciate all her help. Um, staffing, I'm very excited to let you know that we have made an offer to a third senior planner who will be joining us. Um, we don't, we have not landed on a start date, so I'm not going to announce too much, but um, that is going to be happening. You will you will get to meet this person in May. It's very exciting. And um, staff and I will be starting the interview process for our paralegal assistant um, here coming up very soon. We have applications in and just need to start the interview process. Commissioner Beal, I'll need to sit on the director's performance evaluation committee. Uh, <laughs> since she doesn't name the person that has been hired. <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> Okay. And <laughs> DMR grows good employees. <laughs> Our loss is a huge gain for this program. Yes. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. So exciting. Yeah. It's the second time I've seen bite at the elephant, eat the elephant. That's so <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, our wise hive grants management application is coming along. Staff and I um 
tested our brains to no end. In this first phase, we've got a good start. They are coming back with a prototype that we can then sort of pick away at and add to, but that process does continue to move forward. Um, you know, we're staff are in a very busy time managing applications, these board policy discussions, onboarding new staff, and a grants management application. So we have very specific chunks of time that we can de dedicate to things and we've let's just hope the wheels don't fall off the car. <laughs> let's just say that. <laughs> um, May meetings, we are going to stick with our original May meetings and we will offer a Teams option for board members to join in on. Um, we are going to ask that applicants show up in person for that first meeting to give their presentations. I'm not offering a Teams option for your presentation. We're all going to be here live watching those. Um, just as a reminder to you all, we do have proposals coming in April 1st and then again June 3rd and then July 25th. Those are our open um, application deadlines. Board meeting dates, the 24th, we'll be doing the presentations. We'll take a day to have staff compile your preliminary scores. Um, so that we don't have to take a two hour long break. <laughs> we'll do that on, a, on a, a separate day and then we'll come back on the 26th and have all those scores available for you and we'll finalize those, go into executive session and, and make allocations. And then for our um, applicant community, um, we have uh, appraisal oversight committee meetings currently scheduled for April 5th. For those members, I do not have any appraisals in yet for you. And I do know we have at least one applicant who hopes to have their appraisal ready for June 14th and then ap approval in July. So that's that. No, I don't want to add any more dates. <laughs> I want to keep it in small bites. <laughs> okay. Nothing else? Nothing else. Anything else then to be brought before the board? Any new business? Seeing none, motion to adjourn and be in order. Motion by Roger, seconded by Bravo. We are adjourned. Ooh, we got you. Yeah, yeah, nice use of the gavel. Thank you, everybody. That's a good meeting.